National Council of Toronto Chapter, so I was the president of this human rights organization. And Gary had contacted me, he was staff, senior staff at Heritage Toronto, and he said, you know, we have this plaque, and this plaque commemorates Toronto's first Chinatown, but it's actually broken. And City Hall was under renovation, so maybe in first year, as it still is, um, it was under renovation. He said, we need to build a new plaque to commemorate Toronto's first Chinatown, and we're moving from the old bronze class to the new ceramic class. And uh, do you think your organization can help us fund this? And I said, absolutely. To commemorate Toronto's first Chinatown, I'm on it right away. And, uh, and Gary was wonderful to work with, and I know that the work that he did, and my experience with him, was talking about, or sort of basically doing the research, and telling the story of the first settlement of Chinese people in Toronto off of Elizabeth Street uh, as it connects to City Hall. And if you think about Elizabeth Street from Dundas going south to, to the back of City Hall, at one point Elizabeth Street connected all the way to Queen. And of course, many of those properties were expropriated. And my office happens to look north on Elizabeth Street. So it's not lost to me that I actually am working in the, uh, in the space where the street ran through uh, and uh, it housed Toronto's first Chinatown. And uh, so and Gary was a wonderful collaborator on that. So when the plaque, you see that plaque at City Hall, you can think about uh, you know, the work that Gary does at the city of, uh, at Heritage Toronto as he tries to put significant markers and ask people to stop in their daily Russian activity of modern 21st century life. And he says, take a look at this building, take a look at this place, and here's the plaque that tells you the story. And it'll make you look at the place in a different set of uh, different life every single time. So Gary, come on up, and uh, you're going to give us an overview about the history of John Street. Uh, day, uh, and the light filtering through the trees, 
But I thought it was fun just to have a look. There's some wrought iron fence that was actually on the site of this school. Uh, it's there, still in the corner, section. So step at the door, you can have a look. And there's a bit of a sidewalk and uh, stone fence, the house is set well back. That's the allure of the street. The big question is, what happens? And I'll get into that a little bit today, but I'd also like to step back and think, well, what came before this and how did this develop? So we have a bit of the story uh, that works up to where we are. Uh, the story begins with this gentleman, William Jarvis, and this is his son, Samuel Peters Jarvis, in 1791. He is close to Simcoe, uh, to Lieutenant Governor Simcoe. He's in the family compact. He's the provincial secretary and registrar. And uh, he is uh, nicely set up in Newark, Niagara on the Lake. He has no interest in coming to Muddy York. Simcoe is trying to get his provincial officials to come to the new capital. He's one of the last holdouts. He hangs on until 1798. What does Simcoe do to get these folks here? He gives them large park lots, large chunks of land, that uh, he hopes can become land in the states. This is why I'm also hoping to make Toronto into uh, a good representative of uh, British society. We have landed gentry on down. His landed gentry were going to be William Jarvis. And uh, this, if you can see any of this, I don't know how well you can see it in the back. Um, Jarvis is given Park Lot 6, which is right up in here. So it stretches from Queen up to Poor. And uh, those Park Lots, of course, stretch across, and they're given to uh, officials, uh, again, to try to give them some land so they can uh, set themselves up in some degree of wealth. The Grange is, I think, the last remaining state house, if you know it, at Derrick Allen, Ontario, on a park lot. So Samuel, uh, sorry, William Jarvis gets the land, but it's too far out of town, he's not interested in developing it, so he built his house in the town of York, uh, proper uh, to the south. It's his son who inherits the land in 1816, who eventually builds on it, and that's Samuel Peters Jarvis. Samuel Peter's Jarvis is interesting for a number of reasons, but uh, he's a tempestuous kind of guy, not unlike his father. Um, but he's involved in two key moments in Toronto history. So this street, uh, through Samuel Peter's Jarvis, is connected with some, uh, some uh, pretty uh, important moments. One was a duel in 1817, where he killed John Rideout. Uh, they go north of town, John Rideout uh, misfires, I think he has a broken wrist, he's not able to aim very well, and this is and Samuel Peters lines him up and fires and kills him pretty much with, with one shot. <coughs> Samuel Peters is put in jail while they figure it out, it's a scandal in town, but he's released and he's not charged. He's acquitted uh, because the traditions of the duel are upheld in 1817. Uh, the next thing that, uh, that happens, I'll back up yeah, one more time, is um, McKen or, sorry, Samuel Peters Jarvis is associated with, with the raid on uh, Mackenzie's printing press in uh, 1826, when if you remember your Canadian history as we lead up to the Upper Canadian Rebellions, Mackenzie is irritating the family compact, so a bunch of young boys go and grab his printing press and smash it and throw his print into the lake. Samuel Peters Jarvis, at the age of 34, is leading them. He's that kind of guy. So this is the guy that then comes back, uh, he's in the city in 1824, and he builds Hazelburn. And uh, there is Hazelburn, and there is effectively the two lines of the park lot. Queen Street, which is a little uh, dirt road, and a little bridge over a creek that's meandering along Queen, which is then called Watt Street. So Hazelburn is in the middle of those streets. He's living quite comfortably, obviously, quite well. There's a swamp in the back. He goes to go hunting with his friends every now and then, uh, shoots some deer on occasion. Um, but he runs into trouble. He becomes the uh, Secretary of Indian Affairs in 1837. And in the early 1840s, there's a series of government audits that find money outstanding and unaccounted for. And he's effectively suspected for embezzlement, and he's removed from his position in dishonor in 1845. And at that point, he decides to take this park lot that he has, and in order to survive, effectively subdivide it. Who does he get to do it? Another little bit of Toronto history. It's John Howard of High Park and Colbert Lodge fame, who subdivides the lower half uh, particularly of this lot, and he sets it up in a way where at the lower half of the lot you have smaller lots available to uh, the cheaper lots uh, for, uh, for people of average means, and then further up the street, Shooter North, a little bit larger lots for people who have a bit more funds, and then to the north, 
uh, further north, larger lots which people can acquire for some of the larger homes. And this plays out in how uh, Jarvis Street is developed. So this is a uh, shot of uh, 1858 in Atlas showing uh, the lower reaches of um, uh, Jarvis Street up to the Queen Street is here. So there's the St. Lawrence Market, there's uh, St. Lawrence Hall with the market behind it, uh, and the City Hall down at the bottom. So some important cultural institutions already there. And then you can see already very ordinary small lots working their way up Jarvis Street. Jarvis to what Queen is not particularly distinguished for uh, uh, fascinating street or anything different that day. North of Queen, uh, we pick it up over here, and north of Queen, you begin to see some estates uh, of uh, Shooter Street, uh, and then uh, you begin to see them spread out a little bit larger, larger lots as it works its way north. Um, and uh, that's the story of Jarvis Street. Smaller lots of beginning, and as you work more, the larger, wealthier lots that uh, become available. Um, those uh, lots in the middle become occupied by some names that we might recall or remember if you know some Trump history. Charles Scadding, brother of Henry Scadding, um, but uh, also a treasurer of the Home District Bank. So there is one clue of, of uh, his names. George Beardmore, the Beardmore building. How many know the Beardmore building on Front Street? Beautiful uh, building on Front Street that remains. He's a tanner and a leather merchant. James Austin, who built Spadina uh, next to Casaloma on the Davenport Hill. First was on uh, Jarvis, and then moved on up. So there's that story of the development, I think, which is really interesting as well in terms of Jarvis, that sets the tone for the future. Other aspects of Jarvis Street that I think.